This is the Sabbath School lesson for the fourth quarter, 2021. Lesson 5 from the series Present Truth in Deuteronomy is titled The Stranger in Your Gates. It's ready for teaching on October 30 and I'm Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, October 23. Before we start, let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we come to another section of this quarter's study, and we're looking at the stranger in your gates. And for most people who are listening to this podcast, they are strangers to me, but but they're friends because we communicate. And today I'd like to pray for everyone who's listening, but particularly for those who are in Madagascar or Delhi or Jerusalem or Beijing or Jakarta or Albuquerque or Montevideo or Nairobi. Lord, each of us has our own needs, our own issues, our own walk with you. And as we open your word this week, we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us and bless us, that the stranger within our gates will be the lovely Jesus and that he won't be a stranger anymore. Bless us now as we open your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Deuteronomy 10 and verse 19. Therefore, love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Let's read that again. Deuteronomy 10 verse 19. Therefore, love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. As we read last week, when asked by a scribe about the first commandment of all in Mark 12:28, Jesus answered by giving the affirmation of God as one, and that he said, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment, Mark 12, verse 30. However, Jesus continued, talking then about the second like it in verse 31, something that the scribe hadn't asked about. Nevertheless, Jesus, knowing how important it was, said, And the second like it is this, You shall love your neighbour as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Mark 12, verse 31. No commandment greater than these. Jesus linked love for God and love for one's neighbour into one commandment, and that commandment was the greatest of all. Again, Jesus wasn't coming up with something new, something that the Jews hadn't heard before. Instead, the call to love him supremely, the idea of loving one's neighbour and of loving other people as a way to express our love for God was, yes, taken from the book of Deuteronomy. Sunday, October 24. Circumcise your hearts. Deuteronomy 10, a continuation of Deuteronomy 9, is basically God's reaffirmation of the covenant that he had made with Israel. Indeed, much of this book is a kind of covenant renewal. That is, even after their terrible sin at Horeb, at which time no sooner did Moses leave them for a little while than they fell into idolatry, the Lord still wasn't done with them. Read Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 1 to 11. What is going on here that helps us to understand that God forgave his people their sin and was reaffirming the covenant promise made to them and their fathers? Deuteronomy 10, beginning at verse 1. At that time the Lord said to me, Hew for yourself two tables of stone like the first, and come up to me on the mountain, and make yourself an ark of wood. And I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke, and you shall put them in the ark. So I made an ark of acacia wood, hewed two tablets of stone like the first, and went up the mountain having the two tablets in my hand. And he wrote on the tablets according to the first writing, the Ten Commandments, which the Lord had spoken to you in the mountain from the midst of the fire in the day of assembly, and the Lord gave them to me. Then I turned and came down from the mountain and put the tablets in the ark which I had made, and there they are, just as the Lord commanded me. 
Now the children of Israel journeyed from the wells of Benajakim to Mazarah, where Aaron died and where he was buried, and Eleazar his son ministered as priest in his stead. From there they journeyed to Gadgada, and from Gadgada to Jotbatha, at a land of rivers of water. At that time the Lord separated the tribe of Levi to bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, to stand before the Lord to minister to him, and to bless in his name to this day. Therefore Levi has no portion nor inheritance with his brethren. The Lord is his inheritance, just as the Lord your God promised him. As at the first time, I stayed in the mountain forty days and forty nights. The Lord also heard me at that time, and the Lord chose not to destroy you. Then the Lord said to me, Arise, begin your journey before the people, that they may go in and possess the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Moses smashed the Ten Commandment tablets, we read in Deuteronomy 9.17. Then I took the two tablets and threw them out of my two hands and broke them before your eyes. A sign of a broken covenant, as you read in Deuteronomy 32.19. And when the Lord saw it, he spurned them because of the provocation of his sons and daughters. In Patriarchs and Prophets, page 320, we read, To show his abhorrence of their crime, he threw down the tables of stone, and they were broken in the sight of all the people, thus signifying that as they had broken their covenant with God, so God had broken his covenant with them. End of quote. Thus, the fact that God told Moses to hew new tablets, like the first, and he would write on them the words that were on the first, shows that God had forgiven the people and was not done with them, even then. Read Deuteronomy 10, verses 14 to 16. What is God saying to them? What is the meaning of the images that the Lord used here? Deuteronomy 10, beginning at verse 14, Indeed, heaven and the highest heavens belong to the Lord your God, also the earth with all that is in it. The Lord delighted only in your fathers to love them, and he chose their descendants after them, you above all peoples, as it is this day. Therefore circumcise the foreskin of your heart, and be stiff-necked no longer." There's a mixture of images here, the foreskin, the heart, the neck. Nevertheless, the point is clear. Circumcision was a sign of the covenant, but it's only an outward sign. God wanted their hearts, that is, their minds, their affections, their love. The stiff-necked image simply pointed to how stubborn they were in their unwillingness to obey the Lord. And basically, here and elsewhere, the Lord was telling them to stop with their divided loyalties and serve him with all their heart and soul. And so to finish the day, think about all the times the Lord has forgiven you for your sins. What should that tell you about his grace? Monday, October 25. Love the Stranger. Amid these admonitions, Moses declares in Deuteronomy 10.14, Indeed, heaven and the highest heavens belong to the Lord your God, also the earth with all that is in it. What a powerful expression of the sovereignty of the Lord, an idea found in other places in the Bible as well, such as Psalm 24 verse 1, The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. Read Deuteronomy 10, 17 to 19. What other declaration does Moses make about the Lord here? Even more important, what does God command his people as a result of that declaration? Deuteronomy 10, beginning at verse 17. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality nor takes a bribe. 
He administers justice for the fatherless and the widow, and loves the stranger, giving him food and clothing. Therefore, love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Yahweh is not only the sovereign of heaven and earth, but he also is the God of gods and Lord of lords, as we've just read in verse 17. This doesn't mean that there are other gods, lesser gods, such as the supposed gods the pagans around them worshipped. Rather, it was a way of talking about more than just his being the only God. Verse 39 of chapter 32 reads, Now see that I, even I, am he, and there is no God besides me. It asserts his total supremacy over all other powers, real or imagined, either in earth or on earth. The text says too that he is the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality nor takes a bribe. All of this is part of the bigger message. Yahweh is your God and you, his people, need to obey him. What a powerful contrast is being presented here as well. Yes, Yahweh is the God of gods and Lord of lords, the sovereign ruler and sustainer of the creation, as we read in Colossians 1, 16 and 17. But he also cares about the fatherless, the widow and the stranger, and he shows that care by ministering to their immediate physical needs. Colossians 1, 16 reads, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. The God, who takes note if a sparrow falls to the ground in Matthew 10.29, knows about the plight of those on the margins of society. Matthew 10.29, are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin, and not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will? In other words, the Lord is telling the people that, okay, maybe you are chosen, you are special, and I love you, But I love others too, including the needy and helpless among you. And just as I love them, you must love them as well. This is one of your covenant obligations, and an important one too. So to finish today, read Psalm 146 verses 5 to 10. What is the message of the psalm that reflects what God is saying here? And what should this mean to us today as Christians? Psalm 146, beginning at verse 5. Happy is he who has the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps truth forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry, the Lord gives freedom to the prisoners, The Lord opens the eyes of the blind, the Lord raises those who are bowed down, the Lord loves the righteous, the Lord watches over the strangers, he relieves the fatherless and widow, but the way of the wicked he turns upside down. The Lord shall reign forever, your God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord. Tuesday, October 26, for you were strangers in Egypt. Therefore, love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Deuteronomy 10, verse 19. What is the message to ancient Israel here? What should the message from this verse be for us as well? Centuries earlier, the Lord told Abram in Genesis 15:13. Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them four hundred years. Also, we're going to look at Genesis 17, verse 8. Also, I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan, as an everlasting possession, and I will be 
their God. And Acts chapter 13 verse 17, The God of this people Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt, and with an uplifted arm he brought them out of it. This is, of course, what happened, and in the early chapters of Exodus, the dramatic story of their redemption, as we read in Exodus 15, verse 13, You in your mercy have led forth the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them in your strength to your holy habitation. And for salvation in Exodus 14, verse 13. And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. Salvation from Egypt has been recorded for posterity, a symbol, a type of the redemption and salvation that we have been given in Christ Jesus. In this verse, the Lord wants them to remember where they had been and what they had been. And that was strangers in another land. In other words, remember when you were in the margins of society, outcasts, even slaves, and thus at the mercy of those who were stronger than you and who could abuse you and indeed often did. And though Israel was a chosen nation, called of God a kingdom of priests in Exodus 19.6, though there were some differences between them and the strangers among them, especially in regard to religious services, when it came to human rights, the strangers the widow, the orphan, needed to be treated with the same fairness and justice as the Israelites expected for themselves. Read Matthew 7 verse 12. How does the verse encapsulate what the Lord was telling ancient Israel about how they were to treat the weak among them? Matthew 7 and verse 12, Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. This admonition to Israel about how they were to treat outcasts was not by any means the norm in the ancient world. Where outcasts could be treated in some cases no better than animals, if even that well. In contrast, Israel was to be different, a light unto the nations. And yes, that difference would be found in the God whom they worshipped, how they worshipped him, and the whole religious system of truth that God had given them. Yet, their kind treatment of the marginalised could have been a powerful witness to the world of the superiority of their God and of their faith, which, in one sense, was the whole point of their existence anyway, to be a witness to the world of their God. Wednesday, October 27. Judge righteously. As believers, we have been called to reflect the character of God. Paul wrote about my little children for whom I labour in birth again until Christ is formed in you in Galatians 4.19. After all, we had originally been made in the image of God, as you read in Genesis 1.27, an image later defaced by sin. And, as we saw when Moses talked about the power and majesty of God, he also said that God didn't take a bribe, and that he cared about the weak and the outcast. God does this, therefore we need to do the same. Read the following text in Deuteronomy. What is the common theme among them all? Deuteronomy 1 and verse 16, Then I commanded your judges at that time, saying, Hear the cases between your brethren, and judge righteously between a man and his brother, or the stranger who is with him. And Deuteronomy 16 verse 19, You shall not pervert justice, you shall not show partiality, nor take a bribe, for a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of the righteous. And Deuteronomy 24 17, 
You shall not pervert justice, Jew the stranger or the fatherless, nor take a widow's garment as a pledge. And Deuteronomy 27, verse 19. Cursed is the one who perverts the justice, Jew the stranger, the fatherless and widow, and all the people shall say, Amen. It's all but proverbial how the weak, the poor, the outcasts don't get the same kind of justice in most human courts as do those with money, power and connections. It doesn't matter the country, the era, the culture or how lofty the principles of justice and equity that are enshrined in constitutions or laws or whatever. The reality remains the same. The poor, the weak and the outcasts almost never get the justice that others do. That's what is so remarkable about what the Lord himself was saying here. This unfairness, which is everywhere else, should not exist in Israel among God's people, the ones who are to represent him to the world. In a sense, to use a term from the modern era, the Lord wants there to be equal justice under the law in ancient Israel. But this goes even deeper than mere jurisprudence. You shall be holy, for I the Lord your God am holy, we read in Leviticus 19.2. Yes, they knew who the true God was, and they had the correct forms of worship, and they brought the right kinds of offerings. That's all fine. But in the end, what good was all that if they were mistreating the weak and poor among them? Again and again in the prophets, the Lord rails against the oppressors of the poor and the needy in Israel. How can you be holy and mistreat others at the same time? You can't, regardless of how strictly you adhere to proper religious rituals. And so to finish the day... Read Amos 2, verse 6. Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of Israel, and for four, I will not turn away its punishment, because they sell the righteous for silver, and the poor for a pair of sandals. And Amos 4, verse 1. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are on the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, Bring wine, let us drink. And Amos 5, and verse 11. Therefore, because you tread down the poor and take grain taxes from him, though you have built houses of hewn stone, yet you shall not dwell in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink wine from them. And Isaiah 3, verses 14 and 15. The Lord will enter into judgment with the elders of his people and his princes, for you have eaten up the vineyard, the plunder of the poor is in your houses. What do you mean by crushing? my people and grinding the faces of the poor, says the Lord God of hosts. And Isaiah 10 verses 1 and 2, Woe to those who decree unrighteous decrees, who write misfortune which they have prescribed to rob the needy of justice, and to take what is right from the poor of my people, that widows may be their prey, and that they may rob the fatherless. And Jeremiah 2 verse 34, Also on your skirts is found the blood of the lives of the poor innocents. I have not found it by secret search, but plainly on all these things. What are the prophets saying that reflects what the Lord had warned ancient Israel about? What do these words say to us today? Thursday, October 28, Pure Religion Before God Read Deuteronomy 24, verses 10 to 15. What important principles are being expressed here regarding how we are to treat those who are under our control? Deuteronomy 24, beginning at verse 10. 
When you lend your brother anything, you shall not go into his house to get his pledge. You shall stand outside, and the man to whom you lend shall bring the pledge out to you. And if the man is poor, you shall not keep his pledge overnight. You shall in any case return the pledge to him again when the sun goes down, that he may sleep in his own garment and bless you, and it shall be righteousness to you before the Lord your God. You shall not oppress a hired servant who is poor and needy, whether one of your brethren or one of the aliens who is in your land within your gates. Each day you shall give him his wages, and not let the sun go down on it, for he is poor and has set his heart on it, lest he cry out against you to the Lord, and it be sin to you. Again, we see the Lord's concern for basic human dignity. Yes, someone owes you something, and it's time to collect, but show the person a bit of respect, a bit of dignity, will you? Don't go barging into his place and demand it. Instead, wait outside and let him come and give it to you. Deuteronomy 24, 12 and 13 seems to say that if some poor soul gave you his garment as collateral, you need at least to let him sleep in it overnight. The other verses deal with how one treats the poor who work for him or her, who can be so easily oppressed. Don't oppress them, because in the eyes of God it is a sin and surely a grievous one too. Again, if Israel were to be a witness, a holy people walking in truth amid a world steeped in error, idolatry, evil and sin, surely they would have to be kind to the weakest and most marginalised among them. Otherwise, their witness would be nothing. Read James 1, verse 27 through to chapter 2, verse 11. What is James saying here that reflects what the Lord was telling his people in Deuteronomy? What significance is there in the fact that in these verses, James links mistreatment of the poor with the Ten Commandments? James 1, beginning at verse 27, Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings, in fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man, in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes, and say to him, You sit here in a good place, and say to the poor man, You stand there, or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonoured the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? If you really fulfil the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. You do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law, and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, Do not commit adultery, also said, Do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. Though nothing in the Ten Commandments themselves directly relates to showing partiality to the rich over the poor, Sternly adhering to the letter of the law, while at the same time mistreating the poor or needy, makes mockery of one's profession of faith and any claim to keep the commandments. Loving your neighbour as yourself is the highest expression of God's law, and this is present truth now as much as it was in the time of James and as it was when Moses spoke to Israel on the borders of the Holy Land. And so to finish today, why must we as Seventh-day Adventists who take keeping the law seriously make sure we are as serious about the words of James and Deuteronomy? Given what we read in James, why should our belief in the keeping of the law only strengthen our resolve to help the poor and needy among us?
Friday, October 29. Further thought. It is hard to imagine how, even in the best of times, such as under David and Solomon, the people of Israel could have been so blessed by God, and yet could have so oppressed the poor, the helpless, and the outcasts among them. As you read in Amos 5, 11 and 12, Therefore, because you tread down the poor and take grain taxes from him, though you have built houses of hewn stone, yet you shall not dwell in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink wine from them, for I know your manifold transgressions and your mighty sins, afflicting the just and taking bribes, diverting the poor from justice at the gate. And Isaiah 3 verse 14. The Lord will enter into judgment with the elders of his people and his princes. For you have eaten up the vineyard, the plunder of the poor is in your houses. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. 1. Israel needed to remember that they had been strangers in Egypt, which was one reason they were to treat strangers and outcasts in Israel as they wished they had been treated when they were outcasts. How does this truth relate to the gospel, to the idea that through the blood of Jesus we have been freed from the slavery of sin? Why, and in what parallel ways, should what Jesus has done for us impact how we treat others, especially the helpless among us? 2. Think about it. We can worship on the right day and understand the truth about death, hell, the mark of the beast, and so forth. That's fine. But what does it all mean if we treat others nastily or oppress the weak among us or don't administer justice fairly when we need to judge a situation? Especially because of the truth that we have, why must we be extra careful not to think that somehow just knowing the truth in and of itself is all that God requires of us? Why is that a potentially dangerous trap for us? And question three. What role should our faith have in helping us understand what is commonly referred to as human rights? Inside Story Our mission story this week is titled Meshes Received and it's by Yong Suk Chai. Kim Hai Sun is a devout Christian in South Korea. She yearned for God and wanted to know more about his word, so she joined a Bible study with friends but didn't understand the discussion. She soon stopped attending. Her son usually drives a car, but one day she felt like taking the bus. As she waited at the bus stop in front of her house, she overheard two women talking enthusiastically. Read this message, one woman said, holding out her cell phone. Someone sends me a message every day, and I love them. Really? the other woman said. Let me see. Her son found herself drawn to the women. Can I see it too? she asked. She didn't usually talk to strangers, but she was curious. On the cell phone she read, God is love is written upon every opening bud, upon every spire of springing grass. The lovely birds making the air vocal with their happy songs, the delicately tinted flowers in their perfection perfuming the air, the lofty trees of the forest with their rich foliage of living green, all testify to the tender fatherly care of our God and to his desire to make his children happy. Steps to Christ, page 10. Wow, Hai Sun thought, this is what I need. She asked how she could receive the text messages. The woman with the cell phone promised to help. Soon she began receiving daily messages and she expressed her gratitude by replying to each one. On Sundays she texted back, Have a great Lord's Day. After some time, at her texted request for more information, she received the great controversy and other books in the mail. She has stopped sending Sunday greetings, but continues to express joy over the messages and is reading the books that she has received.
The text messages come from Lim Moyong Suk, a Seventh-day Adventist deaconess who sends Ellen White quotations daily to about 2,500 people, including leaders from other denominations. Moyong Suk is praying that Hai Sun and others who read the messages will grow closer to Jesus. I don't know how many people read these messages and how the messages are making a difference in their lives, she said. I am just a sower, but I believe God will make the seed grow and reap its fruits. This mission story illustrates mission objective number one of the Seventh-day Adventist Church's I Will Go strategic plan, to revive the concept of worldwide mission and sacrifice for mission as a way of life involving not only pastors, but every church member. Learn more at IWillGo2020.org. This quarter, your 13th Sabbath offering will support two mission projects in South Korea. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. It's supported by the Sabbath School Department and Hope Channel Australia and is rebroadcast by Christian Record Services and through podcasts at It Is Written in the United States, Hope Channel Germany and through Apple iTunes and SoundCloud. Remember, God is always faithful.